day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He has shown the old man what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Let us be still. Let us close our eyes and bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Most gracious and loving God, Before any human hands touched us, you already knew us. You're closer to us than even our own thoughts. But your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. Still, you love us. Oh God, in the midst of this pandemic, we ask that you show us your ways and help us to trust your ways. To trust your ways when we can't make sense of what's going on within us and around us. to trust your ways even when we grow impatient and believe that we have waited long enough. To trust your ways when we we feel like giving up on ourselves and giving up on the people around us. In these trying times, oh God, leave us not to ourselves and to our limited understanding. Give us patience, O God. Patience to listen and to and to wait on you. And when this crisis tempts us to act out of our fears rather than our faith, When our thoughts turn against us and we harass ourselves and and beat ourselves up over what we've done in the past or failed to do even now. In these moments, oh God, we just ask that you, you hold us. Hold us, Lord. Hold us until we can think your good thoughts about us. Reminding us that you do love us. Oh God, hold us son, until our faith returns, our confidence returns. Hold us until this crisis, whatever trouble we may be going through, troubles us no longer. As you hold us, O oh God, we give to you all that weighs heavy upon our hearts. We give to you the the people in our lives, the the situations in our lives that need more than we can ever provide. O oh God, let your let your spirit fill us with compassion this morning compassion for our poor, for the for the stranger, for all who are hurting. Oh God, in this, this time of, of social distancing, let your spirit be felt by all who, who feel alone, the, the poor and all who are 
walking with grief, all who are struggling with loss and the fear of losing a sense of security. Come now, Lord. Come now to all who are losing their hope for a better tomorrow, especially our children. Hold us, Lord. Remind us uh, again and again that you and you alone will have the final say in everything. Remind us even now that you still have a future and you still have a hope for each and every one of us. And then come, Lord. Come and hold our nation. Come and heal our, our very sick nation. Hold us. Hold us until we do justly, till we love mercy, till we learn how to walk humbly with you. Hold us until we realize that this nation, this world, and all that is in it belongs to you. It's yours, not ours. We're not going to try to tell you how to fix these things this morning. We're just going to let go now. And we're going to trust you. We're simply going to trust you. Hold us now. Hold us in your love until we learn how to love. We ask these blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. selection from our choir, we will be blessed to hear the preaching of Mr. Vernon Jordan, one of the great leaders of our time. Pray for him as he comes to bring us a word from the Lord.
President Frederick, Dean Richardson, faculty, students, alumni, friends of the chapel, the Greater Washington Urban League, to all of you who are here this morning. Can we bow our heads for a minute? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Good morning, Rankin Chapel. I have been privileged to lift my voice from this pulpit many times since 1992, actually, when Dean Evans Crawford first subpoenaed me here. And now Dean Evans Crawford has crossed the River Jordan. He has been summoned to one of the many rooms in his father's house. And his fellow greats, the preachers who commanded this ranking pulpit, Gardner Taylor, Howard Thurman, Mordecai Johnson, Benjamin Elijah Mays, Sam Proctor, Martin Luther King Jr. were all on the balcony of heaven to welcome Dean Crawford to the quiet and the beauty of immortality and eternity. So I am humbled once more to stand where Dean Evans Crawford stood, to preach where he preached so magnificently, and knowing the world is quieter without his voice, I ask of you a moment of silence that Dean Crawford's spirit might fill. Let the chapel say, Amen. Amen. We live in an interesting, often infuriating times. To recount to you the headlines, every racist remark and policy, every scandal, every violation of the norms and standards of decency and behavior would take up all of my time and yours. But this moment in time did not appear in an instant or as a result of a single election. While this year marks 55 years since the signing of the Civil Rights Act, it also marks 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived in North America. In other words, only a fraction of the time that black people have been in this country have our rights been recognized. And even in that relatively brief window, the matter has not been settled or the progress safe. But every issue and inequality that persists today has such deep roots that it is not enough to cut back the thorns and think the work is over. The roots go back beyond the 1960s 
or the 1860s or even 1619. And I believe as a people and a nation, we continue to reckon with that difficult history. And that starts with each of us reflecting on our own history and journey, the shoulders we stand on and the trail we all blaze. So this morning, I'd like to offer you stories of four old men, not Noah or Abraham, Old Testament prophets or kings, apostles or saints, though like those stories, these are stories that over the last 27 years I have surely told in Rankin Chapel, but I wish to share them again because for me they have only gained meaning with time and even more when taken together. As the book of Job reminds us, with the ancient is wisdom, and in the length of days, understanding. So these are stories of four men who inform my understanding of where we've been and where we need to go. The first old man is my grandfather. My grandfather, Jim Griggs, was a sharecropper on Robert Callier's place in Talbot County, Georgia, where I visited every August of my childhood. In the summer of 1947, I got up the nerve to ask my grandfather something that had concerned me before. We were sitting on the front porch of his roadside shanty, rocking to the same rhythm in our rocking chairs. And I said, Pa, I want to ask you a question. Pa said, what is it, boy? I said, Pa, at 70 years old, Way down here in Talbot County, on Mr. Robert Kaya's place, what is it, Pa, that you want most out of life? And Pa raised himself up from that old raggedy rocking chair. He had snuff in the front of his mouth and tobacco in the back of his mouth. He spit that tobacco and snuff all the way to the highway in a straight line. <laughs> and he leaned back and he said, Junior, at 70 years old, way down here in Talbot County, on Mr. Robert Callier's place, all I want out of life is to be able to go to the bathroom indoors in a warm place one time before I die. That was my grandfather's highest aspiration. That was my grandfather's impossible dream to be able to go to the bathroom indoors in a warm place one time before he died. Pa didn't say that he wanted to learn to read and write and do arithmetic. He didn't say he wanted to register to vote or sit on a jury or eat at the lunch counter or go to the library. And he didn't say it because his life was so blinded by segregation, discrimination and dehumanization that his highest aspiration was a basic creature comfort. I am forever reminded 
edified, sanctified, yea, even tormented by my grandfather's experience. The shutters of my grandfather's life were so closed that he could foresee no future for his 12-year-old grandson or himself. My grandfather would not have been able to imagine the progress we have made. He would not have believed that this country would elect Barack Obama to two terms, and he would not be able to fathom Junior standing right here, right now, much less my life and my career. Now, he was not the only one. The second old man is Robert F. Maddox, one of the leading historic figures in Atlanta, Georgia's white elite. He sat on the platform when Booker T. Washington gave the famous Atlanta Compromise speech in 1895. He was the first mayor of Atlanta in 1910. He was mayor of Atlanta in 1910 and president of the First National Bank of Atlanta, president of the American Bankers Association, president of the Garden Clubs of America. And in the summer of 1955, at the end of my sophomore year in college, I was his chauffeur and his butler. Now, this was not my plan. I had come home to work for a national insurance company where I had been hired for a summer internship. But in 1955, when segregation was still a fact of life in Atlanta, the Atlanta executives would not allow me to work in the downtown offices. So for the month of August, I became the chauffeur and butler to Robert F. Maddox. Every morning he would come downstairs, pick out a walking stick and the appropriate straw hat, and while I held the door, he would get in the back of his blue four-door Cadillac, and I would drive him to the First National Bank. After that, I drove him to the Capital City Club for lunch before returning home. While he napped in the afternoon, I read in his huge, beautiful library all afternoon, sitting in his big, comfortable chair over the loud protests of Lizzie, the cook. And Lizzie said, I'm going to tell Mr. Maddox on you, Vernon. You've got no business in his library sitting in his chair. And I said, now, Lizzie, if you tell Mr. Maddox about me reading in his library, I'm going to tell Mr. Maddox about you and your deal with the grocery man. <laughs> if the actual bill was $200, what was presented to Mr. Maddox was $300. <laughs> and Liz's reward was on Friday when I took her back home, she would have two turkeys, two hams, <laughs> which was the dinner after church at Mount Zion Baptist Church. <laughs> One afternoon, I was in the library and Mr. Maddox walked in, in his underwear. He couldn't sleep. He had a bottle of Jack Daniels in one hand and a glass in the other. And he walks in and he says, what are you doing in my library, in my chair, Vernon? And I said, I'm reading, Mr. Maddox. 
reading, I never had a nigga work for me who could read. I responded, Mr. Maddox, I can read. I go to college. He said, you go over there to those colored schools, meaning Morehouse or Clark. I said, no, sir. I'm a student at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. And he stood for a moment. And he said, white children go to that school? Yes, sir. White girls go to that school? Yes, sir. Then he asked a question that explains it all. He says, are you studying to be a teacher or a preacher? Because in his mind, that was the only thing, the only option I had. I said, no, Mr. Maddox. I'm studying political science because I'm going to be a lawyer. He said, niggers are not supposed to be lawyers. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer, Mr. Maddox. He stood perplexed for a moment and then he said, don't you know I have a place downstairs for the help to relax? And I said, yes, I do but you don't want these fine books down there in that old dusty library. I was already practicing law. He stood perplexed, didn't know what to do. He turned around and he said, just go ahead and read then. Later that evening, as a butler, I was serving dinner to Mr. Maddox, his son and daughter, and their spouses. And as I was putting down the vicious swad that Lizzie was so good at, Mr. Maddox said to his family, I have an announcement to make children. Yes, Pa, Vernon can read. Silence. And he goes to school with white children, white girls. And then he said, this race mixing is coming to Georgia, but I'm glad that I won't be here to see it. Well, the Lord moves in mysterious ways. In January of 1961, Mr. Maddox's nurse called his attention to the television. The news broadcast showed me escorting Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes through the mobs at the University of Georgia after a court <laughs> admitted them as the first black student. The nurse said to Mr. Maddox, Mr. Maddox, do you recognize that colored lawyer taking those kids through that mob? Mr. Maddox, it's your chauffeur, Vernon. And Maddox looked hard at the screen and said to the nurse, I always knew that nigga was up to no good. <laughs> And that is what I've come to ask you today, to get up to no good, the good kind of no good, the kind of no good my friend John Lewis calls making good trouble, what in the days of Jesus was simply called ministry, whether it's marching from Selma to Montgomery or driving the money changers from the temple, the kind of no good that at its core is defying oppression for the sake of justice. No good for the greater good. In my case, 
It was becoming a lawyer here at Howard University before going back home to Georgia to fight for civil rights, working on cases like the one that integrated the University of Georgia. When I said, when Maddox said I was no, up to no good, I was literally helping to open the door for Charlene and Hamilton and the other black students that followed them. And so my question for all of us, and especially for the Howard students here today, my question is, what doors will you open? What trouble will you make? What justice will you serve? Because now it's your turn. We may have left slavery, but look at the world today. You can't tell me we've reached freedom. And yet, we must have hope because we know change is possible. Society can change. People can change. And that brings me to my third old man. In May of 1980, I was shot in the back with a 30 6 rifle by a white supremacist in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And when I came out of the operating room after surgery by a black doctor that saved my life, one of the many wires and telegrams that came from Montgomery, once came from Montgomery, Alabama, and it read thusly, I was shocked and saddened to learn of your injury. I am praying for your complete recovery and am thankful that your life was spared. That wire was signed George C. Wallace, governor of Alabama. Now I fought Wallace and what he stood for, but I was glad to get that telegram. I appreciated the wire because it said to me that political differences can be subordinated to common humanity. It said to me that we are all human beings who have to reach out to each other. The story does not end there. A year later, I went to Montgomery to celebrate the retirement of the civil rights champion E.D. Nixon, the first person that Rosa Parks called when she was arrested. Five minutes before the program started, state troopers wheeled Governor George Wallace into the George Washington Carver High School Auditorium. At the end of the program, Governor Wallace had the state troopers put his wheelchair up on the platform and rolled up on the stage toward me. We shook hands. The governor said, Mr. Jordan, you got my telegram in Fort Wayne. You said so in the speech. And I said, Governor, it was the first one that I read. And the governor says, you were shot worse than me. But I hear you still play golf and tennis. And here I am stuck in this damn wheelchair. And then Governor Wallace said to me, Mr. Jordan, will you do something for me? I said, what is it, Governor? And Governor George C. Wallace, the man who proclaimed segregation now, tomorrow, and forever, said to me, Vernon Jordan, will you reach down and hug me? That's the absolute God's honest truth. The mean old racist who once stood in the schoolhouse door 
to keep black people out could no longer stand at all, yet he wished he could stand, not to set himself defiantly across history or thwart history, but rather to embrace me as a brother who shared a common tragedy. My experience with Governor Wallace is a reminder that the road may be long, but we can bring about change in this country, in our laws, and as hard it may be in the hearts of others. But it will not be easy, and it will not happen by itself. That's why students of Howard University, it is now your turn to lead to take the baton, to take the strength of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, of W.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells, of Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, of Thurgood Marshall and Constance Baker Motley, of Martin Luther King and Ella Baker and Rosa Parks and Medgar Evers, of Barbara Jordan and Dorothy Height and Ruby Hurley, too many more to name who have gone before you paved the way and left the great model of leadership. Of course, we also need not look only back, but look around to all those fighting for equality, for justice, and for civil rights today, the role models and mentors, partners, and friends you will need for the road ahead. They may be in public office or leading protests in the public square. They may be titans of industry or found on Twitter. They may be in courtrooms or city halls or corporate offices or right here on the campus of Howard. Or they may even be candidates for president of the United States. It is no secret that we are entering ever closer to an election. Earlier in my career, I did voter registration and citizenship education because we knew and felt and fought for that precious sacred right. And it is my hope that you find a way to participate in this election because we know historically that the black vote giveth and the black vote taketh away. Blessed be the name of the black vote. <laughs> of course, with so many candidates declared, we know it will be a long primary. While primaries are for fighting, general elections are for winning. We cannot lose sight of that ultimate goal, that essential need. So no matter who your candidate is today, I hope that when the time comes, when the primary is in, we will be ready to come together and coalesce around one candidate who will surely serve our country and community with more dignity, more integrity, and more respect. And while this election is still many months away, the work of change is constant. And now it is your turn, your turn to litigate and legislate, your turn to protest and protect, your turn to stand up and speak out, your turn to lead the movement in the modern era and make your voices heard and presence felt, your turn to push the country forward to fight for freedom and build a better future, which brings me to my final old man, the fourth one, whose experience is not like that 
of my grandfather or Robert Maddox or George Wallace because the fourth old man is me. Psalm 71 says, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. So, what can I leave you with at almost 84? What can I declare to this generation? How can I empower you with wisdom and understanding? Perhaps it's this. We live in an age of immediacy, immediate deliveries immediate communication but the work of justice takes time there will be moments of doubt and difficulty and that means you need to find your rock your inspiration for me Rankin Chapel has long been that rock and in this place I have seen and heard many sources of inspiration, teachers and preachers, songs and psalms. Our faith in our church has to be the source of inspiration because as the Lord said to Isaiah, even to your old age I am he, and even to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry you and will deliver you. And just as the Lord will carry us, we must be prepared to carry one another and lift up one another and our community. In fact, I've recently been reflecting on the true meaning of Lift Every Voice and Sing by James Weldon Johnson and his brother. The song has long storied history. One hundred years ago it became the official song of the NAACP. It has been performed and recorded countless times including the recent Notable renditions by Beyonce Noah's Carter and her daughter. It's a song I have sung and heard my entire life. From those earliest days with Paul, through my years in the movement, in moments of joy and moments of sadness. And it will be sung when I leave. And as I have grown older, I have come to marvel at the depths of its wisdom and truth passed across generations. I leave you with these words which feel as appropriate now as they have ever been so that you might carry its light and lead us forward that you may be inspired as you take your turn. And so lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening sky. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony, the road we trod, 
Bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died, and yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our father sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in thy path, we pray, lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. That is our charge to keep, our calling to fulfill, our rendezvous with destiny. And to that end, may we neither stumble nor falter. Rather, may we mount up with wings as eagles. May we run and not be weary. May we walk together, children, and not be faint. Let the chapel say amen. amen. And amen. amen. And amen. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, for those amazing and inspiring words. Though the doors of the chapel remain closed, the spirit of the chapel is alive and well. To support the ministry of the chapel, please visit our website, chapel.howard.edu. There you will find a give link. We are so grateful for your continuous and generous support. There is so much going on in the life of the chapel. We are excited to celebrate the graduating class of 2020. If you know of a graduating senior or graduating graduate student with a compelling story, please see the nomination link on our website. Members of our faculty and staff are encouraged to nominate, and graduates are encouraged to self-nominate as well. We also invite you to join us as we celebrate Senior Sunday, May 3rd where we will commemorate and recognize the gifts and the talents of the class of 2020. Follow us on social media using the handle at Howard U Chapel for updated information, as well as virtual office hours open to faculty, staff, and students. There, you'll also find weekly programs and weekly principles for social distancing. See you next week, where we welcome Dean Richardson, who will lead us in meditations during our virtual chapel service. Dean Richardson will now give us our benediction. We thank you, Mr. Jordan, for that marvelous and powerful message. Now let us be still for our benediction. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And he replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown, but put your hand in the hand of God. And God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.